last night, Adam Tebe and I were uh, sitting late in the evening outside um, on our patio in the back of our residence, uh, watching the stars. And he asked me a question. He said, uh, well, what are my thoughts about um, rebirth? Did I, did I believe in rebirth? And so what was it? In Zen, in the Shoshogi, um, Dogen, I think, uh, tells us that we should penetrate the uh, meaning of life and death. That is our sole purpose, essentially, as Zen Buddhist practitioners, to penetrate that, to realize birth and death. He wrote a, a fascicle in the Shoba Genzo called Shoji, which is birth and death. Birth and death is a constant theme in our practice. Often, we uh, are said to uh, be born and die in each moment with each breath. As we breathe in, we're born. As we breathe out, we die. Breathe in, we're born. Breathe out, we die. I want to answer the question about rebirth by way of a story. Some of you have heard this story before. Uh, some of you have not. Some of you, this is our first time meeting me. But we're talking about life and death, and birth and death. So I'll tell you a story about birth and death, life and death. The story of essentially how I came to Zen. It's a little long, but you'll bear with me. In 1966, I was 19 years old. Uh, in fact, this is the month of May, and on May 29th, uh, 1966, I was in uh, combat in Vietnam, uh, part of a uh, the 3rd Brigade Task Force. I was assigned to play coup, which is in the Central Highlands. I was an infantry soldier. My job was to close with, kill, or capture the enemy. I was trained to kill people, and I did it quite well, actually. Not so proud of that today, but there it was. One day uh, on May 29th, actually May 28th, uh, we were dispatched in helicopters uh, to assist a company that had been surrounded by a battalion of North Vietnamese regular soldiers. The battalion has about 500 men, and the company has about 100 men. So they were outnumbered five to one. We flew in helicopters to this, um, to this place called LZ uh, Alpha 10, I believe. Anyhow, um, as we were coming in, approaching the, the landing zone, it was hot. That means that we were taking fire. Uh, the enemy was shooting at us with uh, rifles and machine guns, uh, rocket propelled grenades, and so forth. So as we entered or flew down, we had the helicopters were in a hurry to get rid of us until they could get out of there. Uh, we had to jump out of the helicopters into elephant grass, which some of us had to jump about 10 feet uh, to land on the ground and roll under fire. It was the rainy season, and uh, the... Uh, the ground was saturated with water. In some places it was standing water. There was really no place to hide. Uh, there were some tree stumps and fallen trees and so forth. Um, it was like a little clearing. And we found some shelter there under, uh, in, behind uh, tree stumps and logs and things. And fired back. Well, about 6 o'clock in the evening, the enemy stopped shooting. Uh, and we established what we call a perimeter, uh, like a circle, sort of like circling the wagons. You know? um, our headquarters was, in, was inside the circle. Uh, we had a perimeter around it. And we sent out a three-person listening post. Uh, three-person listening post means that three people were picked out. Usually they were new guys. Mm -hmm because new guys hadn't had a chance to build relationships so we wouldn't miss them if they were killed. 
uh, we'd send out these three guys with a red filtered flashlight. Uh, and their job was to listen for the enemy to approach. And as the enemy approached, they were to take their red filtered flashlights and flash them as a safe passage across our perimeter. About mid midnight or so, the enemy opened fire. Now understand, the enemy had not gone anywhere. They'd simply stopped shooting. They were buried in the ground in little tunnels and what have you, uh, well hidden. Uh, and they'd simply opened fire. Well, this three-person listening post was right in the middle of this battalion of enemy soldiers. And they panicked, grabbed their rifles, dropped their flashlights, and started running like hell toward the line, the perimeter. They happened to be running toward my part of the perimeter. I did not know who they were. There was machine gun fire, rocket propelled grenades, um, small arms fire. It was like night got turned into day, flashes and stuff like that, tracers. I was scared, I'll tell you what. And I saw these soldiers running at me with uh, rifles. So I shot them. And I, I killed one. one. One fell about 10 feet off to my left. Uh, he dropped to the ground. I hit him in the guts, and gut, gut wounds are very painful. And they, you don't die right away from a gut wound. And this young man, who was 19 years old, same age I was, who was from Washington State, um, screamed in agony. He cried for his mother. He prayed to God. He did all sorts of things uh, to stay alive. Shortly after that, about a half an hour after that, I got shot in the head. Uh, bullet hit me in the helmet and knocked me down. I reached up and felt my head, felt the hole in my head. Uh, I often say to people, I'm going to be one of the few human beings that's touched his own brain. Uh, and I freaked out. I'm screaming for a medic, and under fire, a medic crawled over toward me and put a compressed bandage on my head. That's all he could do for me. It was about 1 o'clock now. And they couldn't dust us off. They couldn't do a medevac until daylight. The helicopters refused to fly in under nighttime firing conditions. So my job, essentially, I thought, was to stay alive. To stay alive, I felt I needed to stay awake. So there was a problem with that, though. Staying awake meant I had to listen to Roundtree die. That was his name. And he cried, and he cried, and he cried. And I listened. That night, I... Uh, developed, I guess, what you would call in the Zen world, great doubt. I wondered what the hell just happened. This wasn't supposed to happen. I'm 19 years old. I'm not supposed to be shot in the head, lying there in the mud. I'm not supposed to have killed one of my own people. Uh, something was just really wrong about this. I, I looked at the sky. I wanted some answers. I wanted uh, I wanted to stay alive, so I'm looking for God, I'm looking for whatever I can uh, to help me survive and to stay awake. I didn't hear much come back from God. Uh, instead, what I felt was a kind of vast emptiness, if you will. Uh, the sky, in effect, opened up, and the universe was there, the entire universe. And I'm reminded of that whenever I'm outside, like we were last night, looking up at the stars. Uh, how the universe can enfold you, wrap you in its darkness, and take care of you. It was at 6 o'clock or so in the morning, the helicopters came in and, and we dusted off. And just before that, this young man died. Now, 
I'm 19 years old, understand. Um, high school dropout. I uh, got shot in the head, which meant after the surgery, after they dug all the bullet fragments out of my head and bone and stuff, uh, I had an eight square inch hole in my head, grenade shrapnel on my back, and I was paralyzed on my left side. I mean, totally paralyzed. I could not move my leg or arm or shoulder and pick it up and just fall down like it was dead. My life as I knew it was over, it was a death of sorts. What do you do when such an event turns your world upside down, shatters your understanding, your assumptions about the way the world works?